We have a lot of things that we want to share with you, and today's message is just one of them. I want to invite you to come and participate in our services here. Join us here every Sunday morning at 930 for our Bible study. We have different speakers that come, and you, I think you'll enjoy them. Matter of fact, today's message is also one of those. I have a special message for you each and every Sunday morning at 1030 right here at Crossroads, which meets at Theater 3, 2800 Ruth Street and Howell, right here in Uptown Dallas. So if you have this Sunday off, come and visit with us, and let's go to the service right now. Three and a half years into his ministry, and the thing that amazes me is that he knew where he was going that day. He knew when he came to the city gates, and he had already sent a couple of people out to ask for a donkey. And what you don't know about that donkey is, is that the king of Israel rode around on a donkey when there were times of great peace in the country. And I thought that was very interesting that he would choose a donkey to ride in on when there were horses, when there were camels, when there were all kinds of things. But he rode in on a symbol that the people would understand but they didn't have it enough understanding to put it together. They didn't get it. You see, what they were looking for, they were looking for a king that would come in with a lot of power and a lot of majesty and come in and take over all of Israel. That's what they were looking for. It's right over there. Uh, would you get that? It's under a, a seat, and if you'd put that, it's right underneath there. Is, it, is that the one that's ringing? Yes. Yeah, do me a favor. Can you off it? Okay. Oh, send our man. Yeah. IT is on the way. <laughs> Missy can program great things. I don't know if you know what Missy does. She actually programs the flight simulators for what, F 16s? F 16s. So our guys train with what she's put together. And you would never know it. <laughs> She's so calm and demure, she would, no, no one would ever know what she does. But here the people of Israel were looking for someone that would come in and kind of take over. They wanted someone that would oust Rome. But the problem was Rome was well prepared. Here was the biggest, the biggest gathering of all the high holy days of Israel. And pilgrims were coming from everywhere. They were coming to celebrate Paso, Passover. And they came here at that point in time. And Jesus was also there. And I think it was very interesting that what happened was he was actually fulfilling prophecy in the fact that he would ride in on a donkey. Everything he did was to fulfill what had been spoken about him. Hundreds, if not thousands of years prior to that, he was living up to what God had called him to do. And yet he still knew where he was going. I don't know if I'd wanted to ride in town or not, but here he was. He was riding into town, and the thing that was so amazing was, you know what? There were people there that he had healed. You know, they came to see. They knew that he was coming into town. And uh, all of the people, Bartimaeus, the blind man, the woman who had been uh, caught in adultery, that he had freed from that. All these people were along the way, and I'm sure he recognized them as he went. So let's kind of take a look at what goes on here. As we kind of remember, uh, there was a lot of trouble times going on. Jerusalem was under siege. All the things that were going on, he was riding into town. He was bringing peace into a troubled world is what he was doing. So let's take a look here as we read this morning. And David was commenting about it this morning. He says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up. You ancient doors and the king of glory that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, ye gates. Lift them up so you, uh, you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord almighty, he is the king of glory. You know, David, when he wrote that, the gates are very interesting and I want us to kind of take a look at this gate. This gate is still celebrated today. This is one of the entrances into the city of Jerusalem. And people go there and they enter in and they go in and they're walking into history. You know, the Holy Land is not but about, oh, 75 miles wide by about 125 miles deep. 
but yet it is thousands of years in history. People have walked there, people have gone, everything is so historic that nothing is turned over, everything is like a relic kind of a thing. But he was talking about those gates and the gates are all about protection. And that gate protects the city and in this city is the Holy of Holies in the temple. And it represented where God really was. So that the people came, and we know that the priest went in, and they would sacrifice for all the sins of everyone there in, in Jerusalem and all the Jews. They would make sacrifices for everyone. And of course, Jesus is, is paralleling all this is because he's coming to be sacrificed as well. They don't even know it yet, but they're celebrating his entry. They're celebrating it, and they're laying down palms and the palms really represent a, a lot of things in the fact that they were laying down part of their life, they were laying down and opening up themselves to a new kind of rule in the fact that they were hoping that Jesus would just come in and he would set up his rule and reign on this earth. What he was really doing was coming to bring peace on earth. And those gates stood in the way and David was talking about, he says, open up those gates. Let the king of glory come in. You know, the temple represented the housing and the presence of the Lord. But you know what? We don't come to church because the presence of the Lord is here. We come and we bring the presence of the Lord with us because where does he abide today? On the inside of us, doesn't he? So if we were to take a look at our own selves, would there be a reason for us to open up that gate as well? And to say, you know what, I, I really do want to be open to what God has for me. And I thought David did such a wonderful job in preparing our hearts today because, you know what, there's oftentimes when we come to church, there are things that block our receptivity of God. And we can be in pain, and we wonder why we, why we are in pain when, when God is here. Why are, why are we short in cash when God is here? Why is this happening when God is here? Why is this happening when God's in my life? You know, oftentimes we do have blockages that we don't really receive Him the way He wants to come in. He really does want to come in and bring peace into a troubled world, and it's your world that He wants to come in. And it's not to say that we're not born again. It's not to say that we're not spirit-filled. It's just the fact that sometimes we do allow things to keep him from really coming in and bringing the peace that really does pass all understanding. <clears throat> David was talking about the needs that were here. I, I agreed with you. I, word of knowledge was there in the fact that there were people here and there still are people who have things that kind of get in the way of where is God in this? But what I'll tell you is, you know what? Before we enter into Jerusalem today, the thing that we want, there are physical needs, spiritual needs, and emotional needs. That's what the people really had. But you know what? You named several names of the names of God, and it's like he's right on my target today. You know, God gave you the same thing because in the name of God, which Jesus was all of that wrapped up coming into this place. He came in as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God that would heal. He was. And he is today. So no matter what your need is, he is there to heal that need. Yes. You know, we've got spiritual needs. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Jehovah to Sidkenu. That is the God that saves us even from ourselves. When we don't have it within us, you know what? He still saves us. He still saves us. And all of the emotional issues that, you know, our community really suffers a lot in the fact that they want so desperately to be close to God but have been told so much that they can't. And there is this emotional issue that they want to be there, they just can't open up that gate because of what they've heard. But you know what? Our God's greater than that. Our God's greater than that because he comes as Jehovah Shalom, the one that brings peace. And what we see here in 
the Palm Sunday issue is, is that Jesus is coming in to bring peace into a troubled world, isn't he? But before we go in, I want us to take a look at some scripture here. Because this is really a good thing. Let's take a look here. Let's start reading right here in John chapter 12. This is six days beforehand. Let's, we're backing up just a little bit. We're doing a little flashback here. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. Who was Lazarus? Who was Lazarus? He was the guy that died. Remember that? And he's also Jesus' best friend. Outside of ministry, Jesus longed for him. And Mary and Martha, they spent a lot of time together. And so here, the runner came. Remember the story? The runner came and said, oh, listen, Lazarus, your friend is dead. And Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. He put it out there with his words that he was not going to die. The kind of death that we understand. And yet he waited three days before he went. I thought that was interesting. But when he got there, remember the story? They were telling him, you know, but he does stink. He's been in the grave this long. And you know what? We don't dare open that tomb because it's going to be bad news. And then he said, open the tomb. And then he made one statement. He said, Lazarus, come forth. I think it's very interesting because if he had not said Lazarus, everybody dead would have come out. He was specific, wasn't he? How many of you have learned to pray specifically for the things that you want? You see, Joel and I are praying specifically for something, aren't we? We've agreed on, on a specific thing. We know now what to pray for. Sometimes we don't pray right because we pray about everything else but the target, but the right thing. We don't oftentimes get it. So let's pick this up. Where, Jesus, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in honor, in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. That's an ointment. An expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of that perfume. Can you just almost smell that? Just like, it was, it's like orange blossom has this fresh kind of citrus kind of aroma to it, Nard does. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him, objected. Why hasn't this perfume been sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Can you imagine? Everything she had gotten for a whole year, she was willing to pour out on his feet. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone, he replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. Now see, everybody had been at Lazarus' funeral because he was an important person in the community. So everybody was there. Everybody saw him wrapped up and laid in there and the tomb shut. Everybody also knew that Jesus had raised him from the dead. So Lazarus now has some kind of notoriety about himself. Everybody knows, oh, you're the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. Yes, that's me. That's me. I can't deny it. I'm here. I was gone. I'm here. There's only two times in the whole Bible that Jesus wept. One of them was at the time when Lazarus died. He wept, I don't think because his best friend had died. I think he wept because he was going to have to bring him back from the presence of God himself. I think he knowing what that was like hurt him to have to bring him back to a mortal life where he'd have to walk again like us. And the second time is on this day as he's crying for Jerusalem because they don't recognize who he is. 
They don't recognize that he's the Prince of Peace. That he has come there to save them. He doesn't recognize that at all. They don't recognize that at all. So, the priests. The chief priests made plan to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many, in the Jew, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Can you imagine? Here's one of the greatest testimonies walking. And what the Jews want to do is want to put him out as well. Because as a result of him, a lot of people were getting saved. A lot of people were converting. And he, these Jewish rabbis didn't want that to happen at all. They were losing contact with their own people. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to believe in him. The next day, the great crowd had come to the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. You know what Hosanna really means? Save us. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of the Jews. They didn't recognize who he was. They saw him as the carpenter still riding in. You know, yeah, he was some notoriety. He had some kind of celebrity hanging out there towards himself. But they still saw him as a physical being coming into the city. What's interesting is the world had gone after Jesus while the religious people we're trying to shut him down. I think that's amazing. Here's all of these people running out of the synagogue to meet this guy. And I imagine they were wanting to shut that down pretty well as, as much as well too. The re religious people were trying to get Jesus to shut the people up. Remember he, when they were coming in, they were yelling all this. And they said, can't you get these people to be quiet? And what was his statement? If I quieten them, the rocks and the hills will cry out. So he didn't want to shut them down. Their praises were causing these rabbis pain. The religious people were in bondage to the law. And somewhere deep inside they knew that Jesus would bring, bring freedom to those they led. There's a story about a guy by the name of Leroy Brooks. He was asleep. It was 2.30 in the morning. <coughs> and a truck at 2.30 in the morning, slid on slick streets right into the side of his house. Took half of his house out. He, <coughs> excuse me, he was not hurt. But the next day when the utility crew was there checking for gas leaks, making sure that there wasn't any leaks going on, <coughs> they noticed that the chimney pipe was clogged with about two feet of soot and leaves. And they made a comment to him. Did you realize that this was going on? He did not realize that for the last two years, he had been suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. He had been waking up with deep headaches, walking in his house with lots of nausea. He was wondering why it's just all going on. But this carbon monoxide fume built up because he used gas logs in his, in his uh, fireplace. So what was happening was he wasn't cleaning the pipe, the, the chimney. The most interesting thing about that is he was a building constructor and built houses. And one of the things that he always gave out with new houses was to be sure to have your chimney swept every two to three years. We can see problems in other people's lives all the time. But it doesn't mean that we can see the ones that are in our own life. We can tell when somebody's got trouble. We see them. But sometimes we don't even recognize the fact that God wants to come in and to do us a favor and do something for us. We see it for other people, but we don't oftentimes see it for us. So let's take a look at this scripture here in Luke. And he came to Jesus where he had been brought up. And his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up for to read. This is when Jesus was reading for all the people. And there was delivered in him a book of the prophet Isaiah. 
And when he had opened up the book, he found the place where it was written. And I think this is so cool. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it back again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to those people who already knew who he was. Can you imagine sitting there and Peter, James, and John were hearing him make that same. He says, this day has been fulfilled in your ears. Today it's fulfilled. You've heard it. I'm here. Jesus really did come to break this, the chains that are all upon us. The things that... Uh, hurt us, the things that people say about us, the things that uh, hurt our physical bodies, the things that hurt our mental issues. We have problems when we don't have enough money to do the things we want to do. We have issues with other people that, that uh, slight us. And Jesus said, you know what? I came to set you free from all that. I came to set you free. I came to set you free from broken relationships. I came to set you free from things that uh, are still going on in your life that are beyond your control. I can't imagine the hurt he took upon himself when he was going into the city and they were expecting something but not him. He's come to save them but they weren't looking to him to save them. You know, it, it's like this morning, during time of praise and worship this morning, it's like having a gift for somebody's birthday, taking it there and not giving it to them. I can't imagine that. Jesus was a gift and people didn't even recognize that he was coming for them. They couldn't receive it because they didn't know who he was. And he sat outside and he wept for them because they were in such agony and pain and they couldn't receive him for who he was. And he's still there. <laughs> he still comes into the city. He still knows what lies ahead of him. He still knows that Herod is going to turn him over. He's still there. You know, it's time to forget the things of the past, isn't it? I think so. So let's take a look at this scripture. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it is sprung up. Do you not receive it, perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. That was spoken about him years and years and years before. Isaiah really knew who Jesus was and never saw him. And here these people are. They saw him and still can't know him. You know, we come to church on, on Sunday to, to worship. Do we really come to expect to get the gift that he's brought? You know, when I think about it, when I think about Palm Sunday, I think about people that could still be captive today in a physical need. They could still be captive to a spiritual need. And they could still be wrapped up in emotional needs. And he's here to heal all of that. But do we recognize him? I want you to take just a moment. David did such a great job during time of praise and worship while ago. But I want you to close your eyes just for a moment. And I want you to ask yourself, am I still 
captive today. Because Jesus came to set me free. You know, there's a lot of pain that you can never feel in your body because it's emotionally deep. It's deep-seated, deep-rooted. Our families don't receive us maybe the way they once did. It causes such a pain. But sometimes that pain reaches down so deep that it begins to affect our physical body. We begin to carry that around with us because it, it hurts so much that our, our physical body begins to take on that manifestation of that hurt and injury. And because of that, then we oftentimes wonder, well, where is God in all this? Why didn't God? God could fix this. God with just a blink of his eye could fix it. That God's here to heal today. That God is here to restore. And to save you from all of that, you just need to recognize that He is here. He's not somewhere far off. He has ridden in today on that donkey to proclaim peace to you. A peace that will bring healing. A peace that will bring wholeness Restore your soul and your mind and your entire being. To bring you back to a place where you really know who He is. Father God, I pray for every person here. I pray that they will open up their gates today to lift their heads and realize that the King of Glory wants to come in. The God that heals, the God that saves, the God that restores. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you have been here from the very first note today. And Father, how you've brought harmony to everything, your presence here. Could anyone not recognize you here today. So Heavenly Father, we open up our lives, our hearts, the gates to who our lives really are, and we open them up to you today. And Father, we receive you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. Next Sunday, is Easter, a day of celebration. I don't know how many of you are aware that right after church, out on Lee Park, it was one of the greatest celebrations of the whole year. Matter of fact, I think it's really pretty fun. It's a lot of fun, matter of fact. If you've never gone to Lee Park on Easter, uh, you can see uh, some of the finest hats in all the land, worn by some of the gayest people I've ever met. Uh, it's Pooch Parade, you can bring your dogs and have them all dressed up. I'm sure Joe will have his puppies all decked out. You're not going to? Are y'all going on vacation? Okay. You, you usually have done that. You've done that. So anyway, next Sunday after church, we're going to go get a bite to eat and go down to the park, Lee Park, the DSO. As long as it's not raining, the Dallas Symphony Orchestra will be out there to play that afternoon. It is a big deal. It's lots of fun. It's family friendly. So bring your kids if you want. It'll be a lot of fun. But let's stand. Join hands with somebody next to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the fact that Jesus is alive. He's well and he's, he's here. Every part of us receives him today. And Father, we give you the glory for it now. And dismiss us in your love. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you. And we'll see you next Sunday. Hi, and thank you for watching today's service. As I spoke to you at the beginning, we have a couple of outreaches which I think are important for you to know that we're participating in, and you might want to join us. We've got one, which is our orphanage in Uganda. It's 320 children, about, 
that have been left there because their parents have either died or are affected by HIV AIDS. There are no relatives that will take them in because it's such a stigma to have HIV or even to be gay there in Uganda. We also have a church in Tegucigalba, Honduras. It's just the starting work, but there is a lot that we can do to help them. And if you'd like to join and be a part of that, we invite you to go to our webpage, www.crossroadscommunitychurch.us, and you'll see a tab there that says donation. You can make your donation through PayPal. It's secure, and we'll get that, and we'll send it on to them. So if you'd like to participate, we thank you for doing it in advance because we know that God is going to bless you. Thank you for watching today, and tune in next week.